Hello ladies and gentlemen, we're steaming ahead now into video 3 of Evolutionary Milestones in which we're going to look at the early evolution of life on Earth. So in the last video we dealt with abiogenesis, that's the origin of life itself. In this video we're going to take a punt at understanding what might have happened very shortly after abiogenesis when life was getting a foothold on Earth and some of the earlier events in the evolution of life on Earth. So life that is around today uses RNA and DNA. These are molecules uh, shown here on the left hand side of our screen. These are long molecules which essentially are used by all life forms uh, on Earth to store information now what happened immediately after abiogenesis, like the event itself, is relatively poorly known. But we suspect longer and uh, more, inf more information rich molecules may have been created fairly early on through evolution. Simpler molecules than RNA may have been a precursor to the informational molecules that we have today. For example, uh, TNA, that's a thing called threose nucleic acid, or PNA, peptide nucleic acid, have all been proposed as potential simpler molecules that could have been important in the early evolution on life. However, most people agree that for a period, life on Earth was primarily RNA based. This is a thing called the RNA world. Now today, as we saw in the um, protein synthesis slide, um, many organisms uh, use DNA. Uh, the uh, exception, the caveat to that, I'll mention in just a minute. Um, and they transcribe DNA to RNA and then the RNA is used to make proteins. So that RNA world would have been a bit different to the DNA world that we have today. There, RNA would have been our primary informational molecule. And we think this is really likely because RNA is an all-in-one molecule. Not only does it store information, but also it's been shown in recent decades to catalyze reactions. Things called ribozymes can catalyze reactions. So this means that it has the capacity to carry out a wide range of important biochemical reactions and storing information. So during this time, the RNA world, we believe that we may have the origin of cells to house and protect the genetic molecules. And eventually, in this world, a switch must have happened to DNA. Now, you may be wondering why we think this occurred. And that's because RNA is relatively unstable compared to DNA. So a really interesting corollary of this idea of an RNA world is that perhaps viruses um, of which I'm sure we're acutely aware right now, um, may be a hangover from this RNA world. So this nasty coronavirus that's causing us uh, to be sitting in our separate rooms rather than in the same room with me delivering this lecture, has its informational molecules composed of RNA. Whether this is considered to be living as you will have learnt from the quiz that I set, is actually really, really challenging. But, and that's something you may have your own opinions on, but the, the fact that they have, viruses have RNA as their informational molecule explains why year after year you may get colds because this reflects the fact that the virus uh, informational molecule, RNA, is mutating relatively fast. So when you can build up immunity to say, one particular cold that may mutate um, relatively quickly to create a large number of different strains to which you may not have immunity to. So that's why in early October, when traditionally all of us have got back together at the start of one of our university terms, there are lots of new viruses uh, which we all become susceptible to in what we tend to call freshest flu. And that's one of the worries with coronavirus right now is that it is going to mutate. And the question is how it will do so but more on that in the Zoom chat if you want to ask questions. So we have an RNA world. Uh, viruses could be a hangover of that. But most of the things that we consider to be truly alive, i.e. everything that's not a virus, um, is more complicated than that. This diagram 
shows a tree of all living organisms. It's a thing called a cladogram. This one is organized into a circle. Uh, Rob will be introducing uh, cladograms in one of his lectures for this course. It shows all major groups of living organisms and how they're related to each other. That's all you need to know about this diagram right now. But an implication of this uh, particular diagram and the relationships it depicts, and an implication indeed of the theory of evolution and the branching nature it takes, is that at some point in the past there must have been a population of organisms from which everything alive today descends. This is often called LUCA, or the last universal common ancestor of life. And it is situated on this cladogram where I've put this star for you here. On the website associated with this video, you can click through to this website here, which actually gives you a um, interactive version of this tree of life that you can use to explore the relationships between all of these different groups, if you so wish. We can tell by looking at what all life that is around today shares some of the elements of the biochemistry of the last universal common ancestor. For example, we believe it had ribosomes for making proteins, it had a DNA, and it had chromosomes. We'll get onto these later. Other details, such as what kind of organism it was, are a bit harder to get at. And recent opinion is divided on whether the last universal common ancestor was a specialist that had evolved to live in high temperature environments. That's an ongoing debate, which I'll let you read about if you so wish. But when it comes to the tree of life and what's descended from that last universal common ancestor, there are three fundamental splits that I'll be introducing over the course of the videos in this chunk of content. And the prokaryotes is a shorthand name for two of those three groups. So the prokaryotes are two groups of organisms, the archaea and the bacteria. And they look like these little sausage shaped things that you can see on this slide here. What I mean by groups is that all of the archaea and the bacteria are more closely related to other archaea and or bacteria than they are to each other. They share, each one of those two groups shares a common ancestor that came sometime after the last universal common ancestor. Something like 10,000 species of prokaryote have been described to date. These are creatures that split by binary fission, and they look something like this. They're generally smaller than 10 microns, so that's thousandths of a millimeter in size. They lack a nucleus, and they lack internal membrane-bound structures, things called organelles, which I'll be introducing with more complex cells in one of the later videos. They contain a single loop of DNA within the cytoplasm, that is one chromosome. They, this group is split into the archaea and the bacteria, as I've mentioned, and the differences between those two groups revolve around the chemistry of their cell wall and the methods by which they use uh, their DNA to make proteins. So they have different methods of protein synthesis. The archaea include the methanogenic bacteria. Those are um, methanogenic bacteria. Sorry, that shouldn't be, that's not correct. They're not bacteria at all, they're archaea. Um, but they include methanogenic forms, that's those that produce methane in anoxic conditions. Whereas, for example, the bacteria include photosynthesizing cyanobacteria. Um, so those are the uh, things that probably first created oxygen on, or free oxygen on the earth. So all of this has been quite theoretical so far. Um, I'm sure you're wondering when the earliest evidence we have for life on Earth dates back to. Now, there's a fair amount of debate on the evidence for traces of life from early Earth, by which I mean there are lots and lots of arguments and they're very, very active. Um, evidence for life when we go back this far includes not only fossils, but isotope ratios in carbon. Um, and sedimentary uh, structures that could be related to life. And all of these go back to somewhere around 4.2 billion years. All of them need to be carefully considered um, because it's very hard 
when you get to rocks of this age to be sure that they haven't been affected by, for example, metamorphism, or that the structures that you're seeing are genuinely the result of biological um, organisms, i.e. that those structures are what we call biogenic. Um, so I'm skipping a whole load of interesting but still debated um, potential pieces of evidence for early life to pr present you with this, what I believe to be a one of the best supported um, fossil deposits. Um, so these are structures from the 3.43 billion year old Strelly Pool um, deposit, which is in Australia. Based on the morphology and the chemistry of the structures that you can see in this slide here, it seems quite well supported and likely that these are biogenic structures and that they represent fossils of an early ecosystem. These probably represent indigenous microfossils preserved within beach rock dripstones, dripstone microfabrics. And they're found in certified quartz aronite. So they're found in sandstones, essentially. They're really small structures. But when it comes to evidence for early life on Earth, I think that these are one of our strongest potential candidates. With that, I wanted to leave uh, you to think about what I've said a tiny bit more, and we'll be moving on to life taking a hold on Earth in our next video. Thank you for your attention.